could become Buddhas. I expect it will take me a few more lifetimes. Um, but there are also, as the religion evolves, many, many, many Buddhas that become part of worship and become depicted in the visual arts. There are only two historical figures. One is Siddhartha Sakyamuni. He is the teaching Buddha of our cosmic age. And the other is Maitreya, who right now, because we haven't destroyed ourselves yet, <laughs> still having a tough time, um, is a bodhisattva. When he is reborn again, he will be a Buddha. He will be the teaching Buddha of the next great cosmic age. So he's also ultimately going to be a historical figure. All of the others are not based on historical people. They're celestial Buddhas. They're transcendent Buddhas. And we could stand here and recite multiple names, but I'm trying to stay away from that. So is everybody got it? Well, thank you. OK, hold on to your hats. Break. And going further. So we're going to start with language again, because this is where things get a little dicey. And Denise does not know where her glasses are. Yes, she does. Um, we're back in India. We're in the 12th, 13th century. And this term starts showing up for representations of Avalokiteshvara, which is Lokeshvara. Um, and you also find that in Southeast Asia. And that's actually, I still find, one of the most confusing things. Because I never understood why Ava became Lokeshvara, or if Ava and Lokeshvara were different. One of the more interesting um, attempts to sort of reconcile the, this sort of popping up of this term, which seems to pop up only in scholarship about certain points in time in India, and also to a certain extent in Southeast Asia, um, occurred uh, in the Himalayan Art Resources Group, which is a attached to the Rubin Museum in New York. And it, if you're really interested in Tibet, it's a great resource for you, and you should really look at it. And they basically do not think this is a separate deity. They think that Lokeshvara is kind of an epithet for Avalokiteshvara. So you would have the lotus-bearing Lokeshvara, the eleven-headed Lokeshvara. And probably what happened is that when people were first discovering this, the sculptures like this, in, nor in northern, northeast India, under the Pala Kingdom, the people who were finding things were not necessarily trained in Buddhism or art history. And so they would ask the local people who it was. And the local people will say, oh, that's Lokeshvara. And then art history created this separate category, which I think we're beginning to feel maybe isn't that different. It's just another name for Ava. So if I were to write a label for something like this now, I'd probably do Ava as either Lokeshvara or the alternative, which is Lokanatha. But I admit that when you're first starting to work on this stuff and first beginning to study it, this can make you really nuts. Because you're like, why is this guy different? Because if we look at our two sculptures, one of which is multi-arm, one of which is not, you basically got the Buddha in the headdress, you've got the lotus, and you've got a proportionately larger kind of, these are not colossal sculptures, but the bodhisattva is colossal in them, attended by a range of deities, um, including women. So this is the goddess Tara, who will come up later. And this is a horse-headed or horse-necked protector, for whom the Sanskrit name is Hayagriva, who will also come up later. So one of the interesting things that we all need to bear in mind is that by the time you're in India in the 12th century, Buddhism does not exist in India. It has been destroyed. It doesn't actually come back to India until Westerners discover it in Sri Lanka and bring it back. Um, so all the way in the sort of first half of our talk, we've been looking basically at Indic and Sinitic traditions and what's preserved in those two traditions. Now we're going to move to Tibetan and East Asian traditions, because those are the places where Buddhism continues to be practiced. It does continue to be practiced in Southeast Asia, um, particularly in Sh Thailand and Sri Lanka. But Hinduism is also spreading. And as you know, Islam is also moving east at this point in time. So you, you're dealing with a very complicated um, religious tradition. And much of our 
early evidence for all of the forms of Ava is actually preserved in East Asia. So going forward, there, the, the two sort of major centers for the development of new changes are Tibet, which leads us to what we sometimes call Tibetan Buddhism, and China, which is where a lot of things like Pure Land, Tiantai, Zen, or Chan as it's more accurately, are evolving in China. So the 10th to the 14th century is a time of enormous changes in Buddhist practice throughout Asia. But because practice stopped in India, there isn't the visual documentation in India that for everything, but you do find the visual documentation in China, Korea, and Japan. So that's where, why we're moving there for a while. And essentially what happens is what we were seeing all the way through, the notion of the bodhisattva of, of compassion as taking many forms and, and having these powerful avatars or manifestations becomes more and more complicated. I should tell you that there is a significant textual basis underlying all of this. There are thousands, thousands of Buddhist sutras and thousands of tantras, which are the Tibetan or esoteric versions of sutras. The most, the largest body of what's called the Tripitaka is actually preserved in Chinese. So there are more Chinese texts than there are Pali, Sanskrit, or Tibetan texts. It's a several thousand volume text. The core version of those seven volume texts this is, this is just a warning of how complicated this is going to get. It's actually was edited by the Japanese in the early 20th century. So what scholars use is called the Taisho Tripitaka, which is the Japanese edition of the Chinese Tripitaka in classical Chinese. And that's the body of text. And were you to decide you wanted to learn classical Chinese, you could find all of the names of all of the Bodhisattva variants of Avalokiteshvara I'm going to show you in those texts. Um, but I didn't give you all the texts because there are multiple texts. What I would say is that the, doc the written evidence from China makes it very clear that all of these forms were pretty much there from the 10th to the 14th century, which suggests that they were also in Indic Buddhist traditions. It's just that we've lost the literary and visual references. Um, and that by the 14th century, Ava is, is taking on more and more manifestations than you can even imagine. So we're going to go through the sum of the, oh, and that Buddhism has become really complicated and has started to put in protective figures and also finally some women. So one of the most popular and well-known is the thousand ar hands and, or arms and thousand eyed form of the Bodhisattva Ava. This is a very famous uh, temple in Japan. It's the Sanju gets to do. Um, and you can see that in sculpture and in painting, they literally show you the thousand arms. Um, sometimes though you'll see 16 or 18 and that's still the thousand arm because this is very hard to sculpt, easier to paint. Each hand has an, has an eye. Ava is the bodhisattva who hears and sees the cries of suffering in the world, clearly with a thousand arms. Avalokiteshvara can be more useful to all of us. And in this particular temple, there are also tons and tons of other manifestations of Ava. So this is a major cult center for this deity. Um, one of the others has the wish-granting jewel and the wheel. This one is fairly self-explanatory. It is a bodhisattva that, uh, or an avatar of Ava that's clearly interacting with the world. So there's a wish-granting jewel something that can grant your wish, and a wheel, which as I'm sure all of you know is a symbol for the teaching of the religion. This particular form, um, you, so you have this sculpture here, and it probably did hold the wheel and the jewel at one point, um, and you can see that, oops, that's not the right thing, sorry. See it in this painting, where you've got the wheel here and the jewel here. So you would have had the wheel here and the jewel here. At this point in Japanese sculpture, quite possible it was a metal extra piece. And most of the sculptures in American collections have lost that stuff. May also have had jewelry. Again, a metal extra piece. Um, the, this particular form usually takes this posture with one leg down and one leg up. It basically has six hands. So even though we don't have our Buddha Amitabha here, we do actually have 
I think are on fairly firm ground for the iconographic identification of this. In this painting, which is in the MFA in Boston, it's much more clearly spelled out. And I would point out to you that the Bodhisattva, seated on a lotus, is on some kind of mountaintop promontory, or quite possibly an island, and is being, is the focus of worship by a woman and her attendant, quite possibly, although we, no one's been able to prove this yet, the donor of the painting. Then you have my favorite form, which is um, Ava of the Unearing Lasso, or Amagapasa, which is the primary deity in the center of this form. And you can see the lotus here, and you can see the lasso here. So this is, this is interesting, because it always makes me think of Wonder Woman. <laughs> and I did see the movie, so I apologize. But, um, the, she has this lasso of truth, right? And then she, she lassoes the bad guy, and the bad guy has to tell the truth. Essentially, what this form of Ava does is it lassoes you, and you have to tell the truth, but you have to tell the truth to yourself. And that's how it helps you get enlightened, because, and you all know this, it's hard to tell the truth to yourself, right? So it forces you to really look at yourself which is, will then essentially help you towards enlightenment. This is also from Dunhuang, by the way. It's a 10th century painting. So you can see our primary deity here. You can see different manifestations or powers here. This is sort of a beginning, kind of a proto-mandala, for those of you that likes those things. You have the monk who probably um, helped with the commissioning of the painting and checked to make sure the iconography was correct. You have the two donors here. At the top, you have five Buddhas. This one is Amitabha, because he's the head of Ava's spiritual lineage. The other five, or the other four, are the head of the other four major religious lineages in Buddhism. So by the 10th or 11th century, the idea of Buddha families, the idea that every single deity of the thousands in the Buddhist pantheon belongs to a specific religious lineage is very, very well developed. I think it was one way of dealing with the fact that it just kept growing and growing and growing and you needed some kind of organization for teaching and practice purposes. So these are the five Buddhas. And then here you have two of the other manifestations of Ava, the thousand hand, thousand eyes, and the wish granting wheel and jewel that we just saw. So this is devotion to this manifestation with hints of devotions to the other ones. And as I pointed out to you, that's actually one of the more complicated issues that we're dealing with because they're not really seen as, they're all manifestations of the same thing and independent deities as well. And then we have the horse-headed form. And if you remember when we were looking at the sculpture from your collection, I said this is the horse-necked or horse-headed being who becomes important. This originally begins due to all of the changes that are happening in Buddhism in India, let's say 8th to 12th century, and then later become Tibetan Buddhism. This is one of the fierce protectors who scares you into becoming enlightenment, but also protects you. And he has a horse's head, and in China and Japan, this becomes a major deity. You can see the horse's head. You can see the three faces. You can see the multiple arms. You will still find the flask, the rosary. Occasionally, you'll also find the lotus. Um, this is a powerful, protective, guiding form of Avalokiteshvara. The horse-headed or horse-neck type was particularly popular with the warrior class in Japan. So you find lots of Japanese representations, probably more in Japan than anywhere else in the world. Um, and then the last, there, there are multiples, but these, I'm showing you the ones that show up in the visual arts the most. The last is a little dicey. It, it um, is a chun, it's called chunda or chundi. You find it at Dunhuang very, very early on, so by the 10th and 11th century. It's a multi-armed form of Avalokiteshvara with the Buddha Amitabha and the headdress generally distinguished from the others by the fact that it carries a parasol. Um, it's not entirely clear where the Indic roots of this deity are. Some people think that it was a goddess figure. 
um, or a low-lying, a, a woman of low class. So multiple explanations are found for it. Whatever it was in India, in China, it is an extremely important protective form of Ava, but one that is relatively rare, sort of 10th to 14th century, you find it at Dunhuang, it sort of disappears, and then in the late Ming, so 16th and 17th century, it seems to have become part of a popular cult. Okay, so we're back in China and we're back in the 6th century, and we're going to talk about some of the traditions that evolved in China at that time, because as I told you, there's sort of the Indo-Himalayan branch of Buddhism and what we might call the Sinitic or East Asian form of Buddhism. In China, in the 6th century, what is very, very important as a practice, so if it's in China, it's in Korea and it's in Japan, is this notion of Pure Land Buddhism. And that form of Buddhism is specifically focused on our celestial Buddha, our celestial Buddha Amitabha, and the idea is, so the, so the idea is embedded in sort of Buddhist traditions generally. The idea is that every powerful deity can generate and maintain a field of merit around themselves. And this is called a pure land or a perfected world or sometimes a paradise. So these powerful beings whose power comes from their spiritual enlightenment, right? So they're, they're so enlightened that they can, you know, they, uh, were I Buddha, I could turn this into a perfect world for all of us, and every one of you would be very happy. This is embedded in Indian Buddhist thought. It becomes a separate practice tradition within China, focused specifically on the Buddha Amitabha. And the notion is that Amitabha's pure land is a mysterious world in the West, the West being the exotic place from the Chinese perspective, so off there somewhere in the West. Since it takes many lifetimes to become enlightened, and it's hard to become enlightened, one of the things you can do is you can decide that you're not going to try for enlightenment this time. You're going to go to this pure land, this Western paradise, which is essentially a way station. And what happens if you die and are reborn in this way station is that you're in a world where all conditions are conducive to the quest for enlightenment. So you don't have to worry about getting your kids into college or paying your bills or who's doing the housework or who's cooking dinner, right? You can just practice. And by having a lifetime in this pure land, you can move yourself forward spiritually so that even if you're reborn, you're, 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 you're sort of in a better space, moving along the continuum towards enlightenment. So by the late 6th century, you've got these, this is from, this is actually in the Freer, and it's a Shang Tang. You have the depictions of the Pure Land starting to show up in the visual arts. You have Amitabha, who is always attended by Avalokiteshvara, or Ava in these things. And you always have these depictions of lotus ponds. And the explanation of the lotus pond is that your soul is reborn in the pure land and it's embedded into a, a closed lotus bud, which is actually at the bottom of a muddy pond. And if you were a good person in the life you just left, your lotus will come up relatively quickly and open and your path to enlightenment will be jump-started. If you were not a good person, there's a possibility that your lotus will stick around in the mud for a while, and it'll take you more time to be reborn. So this notion is really, it, this is a major tradition within East Asian Buddhism, and you find it over and over again. So you find depictions of the Pure Land, which is what this is. It's palatial, it's beautiful, it has lotus ponds, it has bodhisattvas. You find representations of Amitabha associated with other bodhisattvas, and in this case, Avalokiteshvara is right here. And in Japan in particular, you find what are called Raigo or descent paintings. These take some look. This is, and this is one of the great masterpieces. So this is the Western paradise off somewhere, right? Um, this is a monk who's associated with the development of the Pure Land tradition, and he's praying to Amitabha. 
And you're in Japan. This is a very, very Japanese landscape. So everything has shifted very far east. Amitabha, he's about to die. He wants to be reborn here. Amitabha's rushing down on the clouds with his celestial music-making entourage. His power is such that he's sending out little mini versions of himself that are coming down. Um, and then Ava, Lakte Ava and some other bodhisattvas are here. When this person dies, his soul is going to hop on this lotus pedestal. They're going to zoom back to the Pure Land, where he, presumably since he was a monk and a good guy, will be reborn relatively quickly, will eventually then come back to Earth, have more, a lifetime that's more conducive to the practice of enlightenment, and will eventually be a Buddha, an enlightened being. In Japan, this became so literal in people's minds and such a reality that paintings of this type often had pieces of strings attached to them. So as you were lying on your deathbed, you could look at something like this. You could be holding the string, sort of pulling the Buddha towards you so he wouldn't forget to come get you. This has to do with this... this um, huge discussion within Buddhist practice generally, which is, can you get enlightened by yourself, which is one kind of practice, or do you need help? And all through Buddhist thought, throughout all of Asia, throughout time, people tussled with this. You know, is it self-enlightenment? Is it guided enlightenment? Can someone help you? Can you be helped? Um, so I thought before we went back to Ava, I'd point out to you that you do have things talking about these coming or descent paintings in your collection. Both of these were probably part of triptychs. So this is Amitabha, and when he's shown at an angle like this coming down, this is his descent. He probably had two paintings of bodhisattvas, including Ava, to either side. And the painting on your left is one of the bodhisattva groups, probably was on the left side of the triptych with a Buddha and another bodhisattva group. Your two don't match each other, but they're part of the general take. So obviously, Avalokiteshvara, who is becoming an independent deity at the same time that Pure Land Buddhism is evolving, has also um, becomes involved as a savior and guide of souls. So one of the things you could do, this is also from Dunhuai, is you could pray to Ava and have, oops, sorry, him guide you to the Pure Land. So you can see our Avalokiteshvara holding a censer going off to the Pure Land in the upper left-hand corner. And this is the woman who commissioned the painting, which shows her probably after death being led to this perfected world. Because Ava is so incredibly powerful and so profoundly compassionate, Avalokiteshvara can also maintain and generate his own Pure Land which makes perfect sense, right? So, according to the early Indic texts, it's in an island somewhere south of India. By the 10th to the 14th century, when certain types of Ava have become extremely important in China, it mysteriously moves, I don't know how it did this, to an island off the coast of Zhejiang province, which is called Putoshan, which is the name I give you there. And that's still there, that's still dedicated to Ava. That is a place with some of the ugliest Buddhist sculptures I've ever seen in my life, but it is still there. They're all brand new and they're just not meh. <laughs> the other place that this pure land might actually be is also in Tibet and at the Potalika, because the Sanskrit name for this is the Potalika. So the idea that there's the perfected world of Ava accessible to you just kind of moves throughout Buddhism, and there are different locations where Ava can be found. Ava, seated in this pure land, is probably the most prevalent image of Ava in East Asia from the 10th to the 14th century. You find it in all media, and in paintings, and in sculptures. So the imagery that shows you Ava seated in his pure land is basically the bodhisattva in what's known as the relaxation pose with one leg up and one leg either pendant or across the body. Um, something like the stone sculpture would have probably been in a temple or a monastery and there most likely would have been paintings behind it. 
that gave you a sense of what, this, what was going on and why it looked this way. The gilt bronze sculpture, which is quite lovely, by the way, um, would have been perhaps more of a do devotional icon. And whether there was extra information or not is not clear, but it's not impossible that it would have been a shrine or something like that. When you look at paintings, this is a 14th century Korean painting, you get a better sense of what this imagery is like. So you essentially have Ava in this sort of, a variant of this relaxation position with the Buddha in his headdress, wearing elaborate jewelry, and in this case, really, really beautiful clothing, seated on what's probably a promontory or an island off the south coast of China, or the east coast of China. Um, he has a, a halo and a mandala. You can see coral here. You can see that there's water here. And there are lots of attendant figures, including this small boy right here. This is a specific textual reference. It tells you um, it comes from the Avantasaka Sutra, which is associated with Huayan Buddhism, which is another one of the Sinetic texts that discovered. And this is a young pilgrim. And the story is that in order to achieve enlightenment, he walked through all of Asia and met all the great teachers, including the Bodhisattva Ava, and that's how he became enlightened. And now things are going to get really complicated. <laughs> so, so this was such a powerful form in the Sinitic traditions and so often depicted that it started sort of evolving within itself um, and one of the evolutions that we have to deal with is that all of a sudden you get what looks like Ava in his pure land or in his paradise on Patalika. So again, seated on a cliff, um, waves rushing around, um, clearly not shown. Um, they often call this form, I'm sorry, I forgot to say it. I should go back, the water moon Guanyin, which you sort of see here, but you definitely see here. Um, and for some reason, the water moon form of Avalokiteshvara is sometimes shown wearing a white robe. So this is the water moon as the white robed. So it's Ava as the water moon as the white robed. Complicated. Um, and uh, clearly tied to the Pure Land cult, clearly tied to the idea of Putoshan as Avi Ava's personal paradise, still very much the same kind of imagery, but with a white robe. And it's not clear why the white robe pops up. There are texts describing it. Um, some people think it comes from Tibetan Buddhism. Some people think it's a sign of purity. Um, it's something that would make a great PhD thesis if anybody wants one. Um, but it's definitely there, and it's really popular. So one of the things that happens with Buddhism during this point in time, and therefore what happens with the cult of Ava, is that you get a rise of a great many textually based, but not as heavily textually based, forms of the Bodhisattva Ava that are really about personal and popular practice. The water moon and the white robed are, are definitely on the cusp between sort of clerical practice and popular practice. They're used by many people. I would argue that that's why we have so many representations in the visual arts in East Asia, because they're so important as devotion. But they, in fact, you also have others that are harder to find. One of the types that you find primarily in China, and this is not surprising, is Ava as the giver of sons, because sons are good. They continue the family line. Um, easily recognizable as Ava, often conflated with the white moon or the water rose. So this, it's got the headdress that you think of as Ava by the fact that the figure is holding a small child in its hands. Well, I'm not doing this right. Right here and right there. Um, in this case, this particular painting has been conflated with lots of things. So you've got your small child, Sudana, or Sansai here. And you, I think some of you will find surprising you have Ava riding on the back of a lion, which is usually associated with another type of, uh, another bodhisattva. Um, interestingly enough, by, by the time this painting is painted, so it's late Ming, 16th century, 
the whole thing has become so complicated that Ava also sometimes rides a lion. And there's a concept of Ava as, as the, associated Ava with the lion's roar. And the idea of a lion's roar, which is well established in Buddhist text, has to do with the fact, it has to do with the moment of enlightenment when you get it, and then you roar like a lion. So if you think about it, when you've worked really, really hard at learning something, and you've got it, you go, I got it, I got it, I finally got it, that's what this is. It's just, I got it, I understand it. By this time, you also get, and this is where we're, someone was asking me about, and Lord help us, we're going to go there. Forms of, or manifestations or avatars of ava that are female. Very few of them are. Ava or Guanyin or Kanon is at is either male, because Buddhism was sexism in its youth, um, or it's amorphous. It is only a woman, or she, our bodhisattva is only, it's not an it, it's, she is only female in a very few of the specific manifestations. One of those manifestations is Ava carrying a fish basket. And this is only found in East Asia. It is not found in the Indo or the Himal Indo-Himalayan world. The painting on your left, which is beautiful, is 14th century and a little bit hard to see. So the painting on your right, which is not beautiful, is easier to read, which is why they're both there. Um, and you clearly have a woman. You have, in this case, a woman wearing just basic people clothing, essentially, although you can see hints of the fact that the hardest of jewels is under there somewhere carrying a basket with a fish. And it's easier to see here where the bodhisattva is in full bodhisattva mode, so not sort of shown as a, a lay person, and the basket with a fish. And again, there are children floating around down here, so the idea of giving sons and being female is all there. This is based on a Chinese story of a Buddhist monk who had a beautiful daughter. And many, many, many people wanted to marry his beautiful daughter. And she didn't want to get married. So she kept saying, well, you have to memorize all of the Lotus Sutra, or you have to memorize this, or you have to memorize this. And the first guy did the first memorization, the second guy did the second, first and second memorization, and the third guy managed to m memorize everything she was insisting he had to memorize in order to marry her because she was a devout practitioner of Buddhism. He died right before their wedding night. Probably all that memorization. <laughs> and when they dug up his bones, they found that they were golden. And that proved that this young woman, who was the daughter of a famous cleric, was actually herself a manifestation of Ava. And that's why you get the fish basket, Guanyin, in China and Japan, but not absolutely not in the Indian world. And this particular manifestation, which the text tells us was a woman, is female. Um, one of the things that's happened I in the West as we've started to, to learn more about Buddhism, which has been really going on since the late 19th century, is the perception that Ava was the Buddhist Madonna or a goddess and was always female. That's not true. But I, this is my take on it. I think when, when those of us who were raised in other traditions first started to grapple with the religious art of Asia, if you look at Indian art at all, it's always very sinuous. Um, and to our Western eyes, that looks female. So I have had multiple undergraduates over the years look at a Shiva or a Vishnu, somebody who's clearly a male god, and say, she. And what they're responding to is this sort of sinuous beauty that f we've been taught to associate with being a woman. The fact is, Indian art's easy to distinguish if there are not certain obvious female characteristics on the body. I don't care how sinuous it is, it's a guy. It's really, really basic. Go look in your galleries, you'll spot it like this. Um, the other thing that happens uh, is that things like the, the clay, por the porcelain that I'm showing on your left, began to be traded to Europe in some numbers. This is what's called dowa ware 
or Blandeshin, if you prefer. And essentially, this is kind of a popular manifestation of Avalokiteshvara. It's possibly a reference to another one of the stories where Avalokiteshvara, Ava, helps the dragon king escape from tight circumstances, and the dragon then floats her, him across the waters. But it's the kind of popular devotional icon that is in China, sort of in the late Ming and throughout the Qing dynasty, and is being traded to Europeans. So you have, you know, kind of a conflation of the Putoshana of Alokiteshvara, the water moon, the white robed, definitely still Ava, recognizable, in these very elegant and beautiful forms. And much the same way, I think that Westerners first responded to the sensuality of Indian sculpture by assuming everybody was a woman. I think for a lot of us, this feels very female. And so we started this story in Western scholarship that Ava was the Buddhist Madonna. That's really not accurate. It's definitely not the mother of the Buddha, right? I mean, um, I don't, so, so it's, it's a powerful bodhisattva that's essentially male, or at best a kind of mixed uh, gender, be, uh, sort of, uh, amorphous being, no, no real gender, and only in a very few manifestations, the giver of sons, the fish basket, do we have textual evidence that this particular form, this avatar, comes back to guide us in female guise. So it, it, it's very confusing because if you read through all the literature, you will find she and Guanyin. If you get on Wikipedia, you'll see that Guanyin's presumably a woman. Um, I don't think this is right. I think certain, ma there are like 33 ma major manifestations, maybe three to five of them are female. But it's very, very much in our culture and it's probably a result of global trade in porcelain and these kinds of things that to Western eyes look very female, kind of coming in and, um, changing, sort of just becoming part of Western popular culture. The other thing that happens in East Asia is that different regions of China, Korea, and Japan adapt Avalokiteshvara as sort of a local deity and create very geographically specific forms or manifestations. So one of those comes from Yunnan, which I'm sure you all know is in southwest China, it's associated with the Dali Kingdom, sort of 10th to 13th century, which was within the greater sphere of China, a kind of independent kingdom at this point in time. Actually, it starts as early as the 8th, I think. Um, if you look at it and you think about what we were saying as sort of South Indian and Southeast Asian imagery, the imagery really derives from Southeast Asia. It's that kind of simple torso with the sarang and the belt and the jewelry. Uh, this particular form is associated with the ruling family in the Dali Kingdom. It's popularly known as the luck of Yunnan. And it's basically a devotional image that's both intended to uh, be worshipped as a form of Ava, but is really also a little bit about this kingdom and its ruling family and their sacred right to rule. Very, very typical. You find little bits of this around Asia. Since you guys had this one, we went with this one. Um, the other thing that happens in Japan is something called Honji Suejaku. So th what this is, is everybody kind of takes Buddhism, which, remember, is incredibly complex and they try to localize it. They try to make it belong to their own tradition and their own beliefs. So in Japan, over time, there becomes this theory of matching gods. And this theory of matching gods says that every local, or what would might be called a Shinto deity, has a Buddhist form. And that Buddhist form, when it's in Japan, is therefore a Japanese god not an Indian one. So what I'm showing you here are two examples in which, um, of Kasuga. So we're, we're in Nara, basically, or around Nara. This is the Kasuga Plain. We're at a very, very famous Shinto temple, which is dedicated to native or Shinto gods, so indigenous Japanese deities. But we're looking at these deities in their Buddhist forms. So the 11-headed Ava is right here as one of the major forms. For those of you that have been to this region of Japan, you know that one of the things you find in Nara are the sacred deer, 
which are manifestations of the form of the Shinto gods, so they're here on the Nara plane, and the sacred deer then becomes part of this larger cult with Avalokiteshvara with 11 heads up here. I should tell you that I personally intensely dislike the sacred deer of Nara. They have, when I was a young, starving graduate student for, in Nara for the first time, I was in jeans with a, a notebook in my pocket and the bloody deer ate my notebook. <laughs> I have never forgiven them. I don't care how sacred they are. I'm also, frankly, a little afraid of them. So, so, so that's, that's what happens. So Ava takes this other avatar in Japan where it's literally a manifestation of a local native deity and associated with an absolute place, which is the Kusuga Plain, which is where the Kusuga Shrine is located and where all of the deities are seen as interpretations of one another. It's very, very complicated. And then we get to our last deity, which is Tara, which is clearly, you see, we saw her as an attendant to Ava in the Pala period in those Lokashvara, Lokanatha forms. Um, it's, this, Tara is a woman. There's no problem with this. Tara is a woman. Um, People don't know what to do with female deities in Buddhism, right? Is Tara a Buddha? Quite possibly. Is she a Bodhisattva? Absolutely. But we land up saying goddess because somehow, I think, because of our own Judeo tradition, or, or for most of us, the Judeo Christian tradition, the notion of divinity as female is a little uncomfortable. So everybody dances around who and what Tara is. What is very, very clear is that she's deeply associated with Ava. Whether or not she's a manifestation or an independent deity is um, hard to determine. I tend to think she's an independent deity, but she clearly takes the same form and has the same powers as Ava. So just to give you an example, you can see very clearly that there's a lotus here and also that there's a little Buddha in the headdress. Um, and in the rather badly damaged wood piece on your right, you can see that she is also a saviorist from the Ten Perils. So that's exactly the same structure and iconography and typology that we saw at the caves at Arangaban and in the painting from Dunhuang. So clearly she's an equivalent in female form. Um, and then she also takes multiple manifestations. There's a green form, there's a white form, there's a red form. Arms can change, heads can change, very, very much functions like a Buddha or a Bodhisattva. Uh, these are two green-formed variants, and what I want to show you is that just like Ava, Tara can sometimes be seated in a mountainous location or off on a cliff somewhere, and that's probably also a reference to a perfected world or a pure land. And then, of course, I did want to remind you as my final slide, and then I will stay here till 12.30 and take your questions, that the Dalai Lama, who is always an avatar or a reincarnation of the previous holder of that title, is understood within Tibetan Buddhism to be a, a manifestation or an avatar of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, which is why the center of that particular sect of Tibetan Buddhism is called Potalaka. Thank you. Thank you very much.